right, let's take just a few more breaths together. All right, thank you, Jay Han. Hope to hearing more from you later this evening. And for all of you, welcome to Stories of Empathy and Progress, Understanding Trump Supporters. I am just so happy as I look to these names. Some of you have known for years. Oh gosh, Betsy Robbins, uh, some new friends recently, uh, Janet, Leela, Lilia, uh, it's a wide, wide range of folks. And I just wanna say thank you for showing up, whatever it took for you to show up, internal or external, whatever you had to clear so that you could show up for tonight's event. I do thank you. I wanna start by saying that this is a peacemaking event. To make peace, you have to go to where there's conflict. My hope is that we share that intention with one another. This is not about getting anyone from one side to the other. This is not about converting in any way, shape and form. Many of us here have been to seminars or Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been to both. And one thing that have, has always drawn me to seminars and AA is the authentic sharing that happens. And I just invite you to recall some of those shares. Maybe you've done them yourself or you've heard someone share at a seminar or at AA where there is no I agree or I disagree with that paradigm. I want to allow that to land. Just notice how you listen when you are hearing these people share their lives, their views, rather than coming from this analytical, I agree or I disagree, which is the foundation for an argument, for this good, bad binary, either you're on my team or not on my team. Rather, there is this, I see you quality. And I know when I was at AA, there were some experiences that people shared where it's like, wow, I can't imagine myself thinking that way and doing those things that this person did. Yet there was no judgment for me. It was, I see you. That's the spirit of what we're up to tonight. My commitment is that this be a high vibe event as opposed to a low vibe event. This can go one of two ways. <laughs> I don't have ultimate control over it, but I am attempting to enroll you in how this is going to go. That there's a low vibe way, which might be characterized by uh, blaming, anger, resentment, guilt, shaming, uh, frustration, anger at me, anger at someone else here. That's one way this can go. Another way this can go is this be a high vibe, high vibration event where there is love, there is unity, there is respect, there is growth. My invitation to you is to play an active role in this being a high vibe event. And I would love to hear from you in the chat box as I go through this introduction and set the table for what's to come. If you just share in the chat box, what would make this event amazingly high vibe for you? This is a co-creation. So as I go through this, what would make this event amazing for you? Okay, uh, one thing that we have uh, in place is, oh, this is a good note. I mentioned this in one of the messages, but if you could please turn your videos on. So much of this is getting away from the anonymity or hiding out behind our devices. And I could go on about that. I think you get it though. <laughs> You're showing up for a live event for a reason to have that connection. We're doing it over Zoom for a reason. So my request is that you turn your video on so that we can actually see you and connect on that human to human level. And Again, space of no judgment. We just want to be able to connect. <laughs> All right, thanks for some of these shares. Curiosity and confidentiality. Yes, we will address that. Uh, both those pieces, 
laughter, vulnerability, connection, our humanity and emotions. Yes, thank you, Julia. Amy, interested in unity and co-creating a peaceful world. Leela, the fact we are here, taking this action is high vibe enough for me. Action is needed for peace. Beautiful. As this event has been uh, progressing and just in the lead up, uh, the question was, are we ready for an event like this? And that's a subjective call. There is no objective reality we can really get on board for. We're a bit too fragmented <laughs> to be able to comment objectively that we are ready for an event like this. So I can only provide you my subjective answer, which is that some people are and some people are not. Personally, I say it's time for an event like this. Why? Because there's never a bad time for empathy and open conversation. And the sooner we have those open conversations, the better off we all are. That's my view. Now you might be asking, what makes me the one to be leading this conversation? You know, when I first heard the term privilege in regards to social issues, I thought, well, that describes me pretty much to a T. Straight white American male. <laughs> the term was pretty much designed for people like me. And I want to be the first to humbly admit that when I'm inside that zone of speaking to fellow straight white American males, that's my wheelhouse. When I venture outside of that and try to uh, relate to the experience of anyone who is not that, that's where things get more challenging. And I was recently reminded through my own stumbling and making some statements that I, uh, I want to say I regret doing because it's all learning and growing, <laughs> but I can see the ignorance of now that I can only speak with authority on my own experience. And I think this is a really great reminder, just going back to subjective reality, speak with authority on my own experience. And at the same time, I know a few things about the universal human experience. I know it's critical for us to feel safe and we all need to be heard. And I would venture so far as to say, as part of the human experience, we need to be heard. We owe that to one another, no exceptions. That's a view that I have. And if you're here tonight, my hope is that you share some of that view. Now, why does this matter to me? I'll start by sharing that I was bullied a lot uh, as a kid. I know I mentioned I was white, but technically my mother's Chinese, my dad's Jewish, so I look different from the other kids. I was a shy kid too, so whenever I spoke, I don't know if anyone can relate, it had this effect of coming off really awkward whenever I spoke. Maybe I just didn't have a whole lot of practice with speaking to people, but I was very awkward and was called ugly a lot. And I was also called stupid, and that one really bugged me because I had this strong sense that while you might have me on the looks department at the time, and you might have me in the sports department, right? I can run circles around you in the brains department. Yet my grades didn't reflect that. So I was really hung up on this idea of proving how smart I was. And I remember hitting this gold mine of SAT preparation in junior year of high school. And I just delighted in learning all these words that could show how much smarter I was than others. I would say, do you know what mercurial means? Do you know what surreptitious means? No, it means clandestine. Ha, huh? double gotcha. I really enjoyed having that sense of power. And looking back, I can say that I brought this well into my adult life when I took a certain, you might say, power trip in thinking that people were stupid. It was brought to my attention around right about the time I turned 30 that I was a bully. I was in that vein of people who've been bullied, who become bullies themselves. And that pressed a big button for me. My God, I couldn't deny it. I got called bully often enough that there was no way I could deny that. And decided that for me, I would commit to empathy, understanding, 
as my core values in every relationship. And I've stumbled a lot in that. You know, that commitment has always been there, that North Star. I stumbled in my marriage. I got married in 2014. And I was not able to extend empathy to my wife at the time, the way she was running her business, the way she was conducting her spiritual practice, and she made the decision to divorce me. It was a lack of empathy. As the election for 2016 was heightening up, I found myself vigilantly anti-Trump and anti-Trump supporters. And in that regard, I do look back at myself as a bully, whether it was mentally or verbally to others with no hesitation. You're evil, you're stupid, you're ignorant, you're on the other side, you're the enemy. We look at 2020, the present, I think I can speak for a lot of us that this has been a year of chaos, confusion, yet also soul searching. And with tonight's event, it only really clicked for me about three weeks ago when I was at a meditation and then we went to brunch afterwards and I love these people, these are my people. And we're at brunch and there's a Trump caravan that rolls by. And it's just a line of cars with Trump flags and they're blaring their horns. And these people that I had been meditating with and laughing with just suddenly yell back at the Trump supporters, shut up, go away, screw you. Not all of them, but certainly some of them. And what was so clear for me is like, wow, you just became a whole other person <laughs> in that moment. It was visceral. And I saw how I have that tendency, certainly. Yet at the same time, that commitment to empathy, understanding, it just jerked me in that moment. And I just started speaking to it. I said, guys, don't you see? This is what's missing. The empathy, the understanding, the peace, the oneness that we all talk about is missing. And as I went on about this, there was definitely a mixed reaction. Some were on board, others were not. Yet something did get awakened to me that there is room for this conversation. Moreover, it's time for this conversation. So I'd like to move into some of our agreements. But before I do that, Uh, so I just check in the comments, increase my volume. I'm at max. I'll project louder though. Happy to do that. Before we move into our agreements for tonight, I'll say that the enemy is never the other side. It's our own self-righteousness that is the enemy. So I'll repeat that. The enemy is never the other side. The enemy is our own self-righteousness. Now, if you disagree with that, you're probably not gonna get much from this event other than pissed off. My attempt is to enroll you in taking radical self-responsibility for your own righteousness, just like how I had to again and again and again. Sometimes it was too late, but I did learn from it, even in some small way. And now I've gotten to where I can recognize it pretty much as it's happening. And for this event to really work, to really be safe for others, we have to become even better than we've ever been at mastering our own self-righteous behavior, not letting a hijack us. And we'll share a little more about this. Uh, actually, I will go to the share screen. And give me a thumbs up if you can see this. Okay, thank you. So Gandhi is known for the quotes, be the change you wish to see in the world. I love that quote. He's a little less known for this one. And I can't read it fully. Okay. So you can read that. It's, the chat is blocking my view right on the quote. I'll just go off the... Uh, memory, the devils in this world are the ones running around in our hearts. That is where the battles need to be fought. 
I think that sums it up pretty well. Next are seven agreements. Just gotta go with this pretty quickly. One is have fun. This is a tricky one because I try to come from a place of fun with everything we do. My belief is that if we're not having fun, then it's gonna be harder to connect and be loose and grow and evolve. Yeah, at the same time, there is a certain respect to hold in place that everyone has a unique experience and there is trauma that a lot of people do have. So while we say have fun, keep it light, at the same time, there is this respect to have for others who may not be in a particularly fun place. That said, I still stand by that we want to have fun because why the hell not? Next is be kind. Connection matters more than anything. I've become increasingly a kindness punk and just like, wow, just be a renegade stand for kindness because it's so lacking right now. And if we foreground that connection matters more than anything, it matters more than my opinion, it matters more than me dominating over anyone, even subconsciously, what if we were to foreground that connection matters more than anything? Check ourselves in the moment. Do I feel connected to this person? Your indication is that if you're not feeling very kind or charitable or loving, then you're not connected. So that's our second agreement is to be kind. Connection matters more than anything. Learn and grow. Seek to understand before seeking to be understood. I'm not a tattoo person, but if I were, that would be in my forearm. Seek to understand before seeking to be understood. What I know is that it can be very difficult when someone is just throwing their opinions at us like this nonstop barrage, like one baseball after another, throwing their opinions at us. Oh, I got a little too excited there. <laughs> Yet, how in those moments can we seek to understand before seeking to be understood? That's where rubber meets the road. Whether in this, okay, I apologize for this technical challenges. How you can be someone that will get where someone's at, even as they're missed of throwing these fastballs at your head nonstop, how you can get their experience. Because what I know to be true is that if you can be that big of a person, they can't help but respond in kind. That's what I mean by high vibe. That's what I mean by prioritizing connection. Seek to understand before seeking to be understood. No exceptions. Next is discomfort is the door. If we are doing this event right, you will feel uncomfortable at certain times. You have an option at that point to turn and run away. You can drop off this call. No one's going to stop you. Or you can stew angrily. Another option is that you can go through that door. I encourage you just for our 90 minutes tonight to experiment with going through that door, that discomfort. Lean into it. See what happens. I guarantee you won't die. Next, this is not your place to rant and blame. So on one hand, I have a commitment for authentic expression and being true to whatever is there for you. On the other hand, I have just as strong of a commitment that we cannot vomit all over the place and say, this is me being real. There's a responsibility that we must take, like I mentioned earlier, the radical self-responsibility. And a bottom line saying this is order in the court. I had the unpleasant experience of going to court once. And when the judge said order in the court, that was a trigger for me because I'm a pretty rebellious spirit by nature. I don't like rules. I don't like having a boss. I like doing things the way I want to do things. Yet, as time went on that particular day in court, I really appreciated, wow, this holds us to a level of civility that would not happen otherwise. You cannot get emotional and start screaming and pointing the finger, trying to strangle someone. You can't do those things. 
you have to maintain civility. And I really appreciate the accountability of that, which is not being phony or fake or suppressing. Maybe there is some suppressing, but you can transmute that into, all right, I'm gonna calm down and just be direct in my speaking without being pissed off. That to me is having order in the court. I won't say any more about that for right now. Uh, next, make it safe for others. So you see a recurring theme here about connection and making it safe for others in particular means that who can you be such that others are free to express themselves around you? It's a question I invite you not only to ask tonight, but ongoingly. Who can you be such that others can be safe to express themselves around you? Lastly, confidentiality. So you are free to express certain insights from tonight, certain things that happened, yet the agreement we're making is that you will not refer to anyone by name. In particular, our featured guests tonight are ones who have taken a risk showing up tonight. I cannot understate that. They've taken a big risk showing up tonight. So for them and for any of you to feel safe, to fully express yourselves, I request that you honor this confidentiality agreement. All right, that's what I have for you. Next, we are going to bring on our musical guest, Ananiah Jones. I'll say a little bit about Ananiah. I've known her for about 10 years. And my experience of you, Ananiah, is that you're beautiful inside out. You love people. You walk your talk. You have those tough, tough conversations. And the song we've chosen tonight, I Believe in You, to me really speaks to these tough, challenging times that we're experiencing at the level of individual, as well as a level of family, level of the nation, as a global family. And to say, I believe in you, what that means to me is that no matter how rough it may seem, we are gonna get through this. So Ananiah, please take it away. Okay, let's make sure she's unmuted. With my thoughts and dreams, I struggle to see light and reality. Often discouraged and passion subdued, look at myself and see nothing true. Oh, oh. then my truth comes to view. Because you say, I believe in you. Do you know what you do to my soul? When you speak those words to me, you can never, ever know how my life has changed. Because you are here, it's not black and white. And though it feels wrong, you make everything right. Now there's a purpose for me to achieve. No longer silent, my voice will go through and fight for what I know is true. Because you say, I believe in you. Do you know what you do to my heart when you speak those words to me? You can never, ever know how my life has changed. Transform me with every word. Lift me up with every 
plant my feet on solid ground when your love's around I can't just breathe, I can't just be I can't pursue everything that I see Because you believe I'm never down I spread my wings, I stand my ground Oh yeah, yeah, yeah Oh, oh. Do you know what you do to my heart? When you speak those words you think You can never ever know Do you know what you do to my soul? When you speak those words to me You can never ever know Oh, my life has changed now I believe in me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ananaya. You're welcome. Yeah, she was three months pregnant, by the way. So, Mama did <laughs> so much. Yes. <laughs> well, just to uh, connect with you for a few minutes, uh, you bring a fascinating perspective because we've spoken about this that you yes. uh, consider yourself to be a Democrat and you have people who are very close to you who are Trump supporters. So, would you be willing to share about that experience? Um, yes, um, I. It definitely. Um, you know, in the beginning, it's. It, you know, I'd say I definitely had a learning um, gap to go through because um, I would take it very personal and feel like I was being attacked and like how could they, you know, think this way and. Um, and then when I really started to, and I wasn't listening, I was, you know, boom, 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 uh, you know, throwing things out and just, you know, because I, I, I know everything and I'm right. And um, when I really started to see how, wait a minute, I'm doing the very thing that I don't want people to do to me. You know, I don't want people shut me down. And I saw that that was what I was doing. And um, it, it was like a little bit of a, like, oh, okay. And to just, slow down and actually listen and to see where they were coming from and um, it really opened my eyes to um, understanding and actually seeing individuals and not just label you know labels like they're this they're that but and also because you know these people are very close to me i um you know you i saw all the different sides and um I would say it really was a lesson in understanding and actually looking through, um, you know, what, what was on the top and what was so, you know, offensive to me, but it's actually looking through. And then once that was, you know, once that all melted away, I was like, Oh, okay. You know, here's another person that has some very valid reasons for um, their stance and um, for me to respect and, and even, even when, and, and it's still, it's still learning. I'm not perfect. You know, sometimes there's still, sometimes I get like, Ooh, but I always come back around and wait, you know, how would I want to be treated and what, how am I listening? And, um, you know, again, just really connecting to that human spirit and, and that's really, um, helped me to grow and just be more, as you say, empathetic and just listening to um, people that have different um, viewpoints because there's a reason, you know, there's things that they went through in their lives that caused them to come to that point. And um, I think there's something to be said for that. So if we get a uh, specific, I'm personally curious, is that you being a black woman, was that a specific challenge mm -hmm. you had with Trump supporters, was considering them to be sexist and racist? Absolutely. There was times where I would, um, and it was, it was interesting because I, even though I knew that there, there's no way this, you know, these people could be racist, I, but I just felt like for some reason I felt threatened, 
by, you know, the way that they thought. And so there, there was something for me to work at. And I had to ask myself, wait, why am I feeling that? Where is that coming from? Because I could see clearly that it, they're not these, you know, they're not this thing that I have in my head. Like, this is not them. So, yes, there was some, you know, things that I had to really look at and dig deeper and see, oh, some of this stems from us, some other things. Some of this stems from some things that I still needed to work through. So, um, yes, I've had that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what words would you say in terms of creating unity in the world? How, do, how can we move that needle forward? I think doing exactly what we're doing here is actually sitting down, being quiet, and listening to what someone that has some different viewpoints, what they have to say, and, and asking the questions, well, why? Um, you know, where did that come from? Because what I find out, which is really, you know, it's a lot of times I'll be talking and I said, oh, you know what, we actually think the same thing, but we have different languages for it. You, you know, you have this view and I, but then you, I get to look and I'm like, oh, it's not so different. And um, that's been a surprising point, I, you know, that, that I brought up that I brought out and also that not all Democrats are, you know, we're not all one way either. It's like, you know, there's kind of, there's, there's all kinds of shades. So I find myself too, like identifying with some things that um, I would say the other side said, yeah, you know what, I actually agree with that one too. So if I hadn't listened and be quiet and really set, yeah, I don't think I would have come to that understanding. And it's definitely caused me to grow and, and carry this into other aspects. Um, you know, even as I, you know, bring in a little one, you know, just thinking about how I'm going to raise them and, and um, is it pushing all of my things on them or allowing them to hear both sides and decide for themselves. So I, I you know, it's been a tremendous, you know, growth point for me. So. Yeah, definitely a whole other level of investment you have in this world working for everybody. <laughs> So thank you so much, and I, uh, a note for everyone, let's use the chat. A lot of you have done a really great job of that. So reflections, insights, questions for me or anyone that we're featuring. We have a pretty densely packed schedule uh, for the next 50 minutes. So we're gonna keep it moving to our first uh, Trump supporter who will be joining us. And, I just want to quickly reiterate, we have, well, we have three uh, sets of Trump supporters that we'll be uh, spending time with, and the commitment to make it safe for everyone to express their voice. I know that there's a lot of energy that comes up for folks, and maybe we've cleared some of that by this point, yet as we get into the weeds of this, again, honoring the agreements that we made before kindness, connection, curiosity, so you can understand. All right, that's my spiel. Welcome, Dirk. Thanks for being here. Hi, guys. How's everybody doing? We're great. Yeah. So we'll just start with a basic question. Uh, how old are you? Where are you from? Like born and where do you live now? And what do you do for a living? Uh, well, first of all, um, I, I don't live in my truck, so just wanted to point that out. I'm I'm a uh, I'm I've got a, a function to attend after this, so I figured I would drive here and then do it from my phone in the truck. Uh, I am 38 years old. Uh, I am originally uh, I'm born and raised in Texas. Um, I didn't really fit in the culture very much of Texas, though. I, I have to admit that. Um, I was kind of my own person as a kid. I wanted to I loved movies and I wanted to be in Hollywood. And that was always my dream. And when I was 23, I moved out and I moved to Orlando, Florida, and I got into the theme park business where I, uh, I started working for Disney World and I worked for Universal Studios. Uh, after five years of doing that, I went overseas and I worked for Disneyland in Hong Kong. I worked in Universal Studios in Singapore. Then I finally moved to Hollywood and got in the film and television industry. And uh, I have been, uh, I've, I've have, I don't like labels. I never liked labeling myself as a Democrat or I didn't like even registering as one before I voted. I, I didn't, I found, always found myself in the middle, but leaning left. And about eight months ago, um, by the way, John, if you have any questions for me, please, please ask. Really? Um, but about I eight months ago. I was going to say ago, though that you did share with me that you're a world-class stuntman. If you see the 300 sequel, uh, that's Dirk doubling for the lead actor, Sullivan Stapleton. <laughs> I, 
I did. I did a little bit of that. Yes, I've done. Hopefully, some, you're allowed. If, to if any of you guys have out and proud, I think that was pretty awesome when you told me that. Oh, uh, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Yes, I. I there is a good up, just good chance that you guys have seen me in some film and television and movies, and you don't even know it was me. Uh, I played Lizard Man for two years on the show Mighty Med, which is a Disney show. I was in Three Hundred. Uh, I'm in The Tenant uh, Invasion, which is still being made a lot of movies so yeah this is my this is my so my you're about to lead into my next question Angeles. was uh, how did you come to be a trump supporter it's so weird for me to even to hear that that expression that's how new i am to it it is very strange to hear someone refer to me as a trump supporter because if you knew me up until eight months ago we could have a conversation about how much we hated trump um, as I said, I worked in the entertainment industry. The entertainment industry, especially in theme parks, has a, a very diverse LGBT community. And I always related so much better to people on the left because they were in my field of entertainment. They, they wanted to be stuntmen and actors and voiceover artists and models. So I just felt like they were friendlier or something. It was something about it. And as I got older and I, I got more interested in, in politics, I, I started just kind of looking at Republicans like, like they were just, just wrong, like they were bad people. I, I, didn't, I didn't quite get it. I didn't understand why were they racist? Why were they homophobic? Why were they xenophobic? I didn't understand any of this stuff. But I also never really, by the way, is this better? Is that better? Uh, I never really looked into it. I never really researched it. I never sat down and said, okay, I want to look into this for myself. And I, I, I have a, a, a girlfriend out here of six years and she felt the same way as I did. So we connected that way. And I had this friend who, he's my best friend and he's my business partner. And he, I felt was right leaning. He was a Trump supporter, but we never really talked about it that much. We kind of kept that quiet because we didn't want it to hurt our friendship. And the COVID shutdown started happening. And I, because of my girlfriend and her involvement with the pharmaceutical industry, my girlfriend has suffered for, from chronic illness for 17 years. Crohn's disease, colitis, H. pylori, Epstein-Barr virus, high lead and mold poison, you name it, she's had it. And she fought with her doctors in the pharmaceutical company for a very, very long time saying, I do not want to take these drugs. I think these drugs are making me worse. They're lowering my immune system. I'm getting worse as the years go on. The doctors say, take these drugs, take these drugs. They'll give you relief. Well, I, I started seeing the research she was doing and I started turning away from the pharmaceutical industry. Then the COVID shutdown happened. So my knowledge of the pharmaceutical industry and, and the dangers that can come with that, I'll, I'll say, started making me question the, the COVID shutdown. I was talking to my, my good friend about this and he said, dude, we need to talk. And I said, okay. He said, let me show you some stuff about Trump that you might not know. And he tells me, he lets me know, know this. I, I, I did not know this before, but he used to work for NBC. He was a cameraman and he got promoted to stage manager and he eventually, I think, was director. And he, he was the youngest in that facility's history to be as promoted to stage director and he said he worked there for two years and during that time he noticed there was a hierarchy of how sh how certain stories would be broadcasted on NBC and if this manager didn't like it it got wiped away if this manager didn't like like it it got wiped away until it finally got to the very top he just noticed there was a narrative being put out and I found that kind of interesting so I started looking into it I was kind of blown away by what I saw and what I researched. And it was so bad that I was sick to my stomach for about a month or two um, with how much I was learning that was not the way I thought it was for the last 15 years. I uh, started really researching it and I, I started looking into Trump and I started finally reconsidering the way I thought about him, reconsidering the way I was told to think about him. Because to be honest, I didn't research any of this stuff. I watched the news or I watched the news that my friends would push on Facebook. And yeah, I agreed with it. Yeah, that, that looks like a racist thing. Yeah, that looks like a, a xenophobic thing. Oh God, that guy said that. How could he say that? Why do people like this guy? I, I couldn't figure it out. 
Well, after I started looking into it more, I, I started watching Trump speeches. And I would watch the whole thing. And I would be like, you know, there really wasn't much in that speech that I really disagree with. Well, then the next day, I would notice on Facebook excerpts of that speech posted on Facebook by my left friends. And it would be news articles saying, Trump said this. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I remember him saying that. And it's, it wasn't this bad. It, and, and then I started looking at footage from old, old speeches that he had done that I hated. I absolutely hated. Like the, the great example is the, the Charlottesville, uh, the good people on both sides, Charlottesville incident. I, you asked my girlfriend, I was so angry that night that he could say something like there are good people on both sides, on the racist side, on the non-racist side. And it drove me crazy. When I went back and reviewed the footage, I noticed that he had prior to that said, if you exclude the racists, the neo-Nazis, the white supremacists, there were good people on both sides. And that kind of blew me away when I, when I saw that. So I started investigating more and more things that I hated about Trump. And I came to find out in my realization that a lot of them just plain weren't true or there was an explanation for and when I looked into you know, the racism thing and I found out that Trump has signed bills that have pushed money to historically black colleges and universities, I was like, well, that's an odd thing for a racist to do. And then I looked at the LGBT uh, community issues. I found out, and again, I'm not an expert. Y'all might be able to present something to me that'll blow me away about Trump that I didn't know. I don't have all the answers. I'm new to this. Again, I've only, been, I've only walked away from the left seven or eight months ago. So I, I don't have all the answers, but what I have researched is that Trump is the first, as far as I know, the first president to go into office supporting the LGBT. And I, I found that kind of interesting. I then found out recently he's the first president, or so far the only person talking about it, that is trying to decriminalize LG, being LGBT worldwide. Uh, he's talking to foreign leaders about this. Um, and then there is the, uh, the Jeffrey Epstein case. That one really got to me whenever I learned there was a guy named Jeffrey Epstein that was sex trafficking children on an island. And to me, that sounds like a conspiracy in itself, but it turns out it was very true and it's still going on. Well, I looked into it and there was one guy, one politician that was actually speaking out about this and that was Trump. And I went to research Obama and Hillary and all these other people that I had voted for. Obama twice, I voted for Hillary, I voted for Bernie in 2016 to be the Democratic nominee. And uh, I, didn't, I couldn't find any footage or evidence or anything of them speaking out so much about child trafficking. And a lot of people might think, well, what do you mean Trump has spoken out about this? I know, no one knows because mainstream does not seem to want to show this. I, I can't find it. And, but if I go to independent news sources, I find it everywhere. And then I, get, I went back to my buddy Pete, who said he used to work for NBC, and just a connection of the dots. It, was, it blew me away, John. It really, really did. It made me sick to my stomach with all these people in my life that I've deleted out of my life because I just couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't stand the bigotry, the bigotry. I couldn't stand the, the racism. I couldn't stand the defense for this, for this man. But then I started thinking about, I think I have been misjudging these people. And I think, and I'm not sure, it took me a long time to come to terms with it, but I'm, I think my hatred for these individuals, these Republicans and for the, the, these Trump people has been somewhat manufactured. I think it's been, it's been, it's been brainwashed into me. So recently I have, I have, I haven't even come out really as a Trump supporter. That's the funny thing. Again, it's funny for me to even say, the only person that really knows is my dad. My mom doesn't even know it. She's in the middle. Uh, so this, this I found was a good opportunity for me to kind of come on and tell my story. And uh, I, I really hope that people don't look at me. I mean, I've been called racist recently for standing next to Trump supporters. And when I see so many people getting called racist, 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 I'm like, that, that can't be though. These people are not racist. I know these people, they're, they're wonderful people. I know gay people who are strong Trump supporters, trans people that are Trump supporters, lots of black community, Hispanic community that are Trump supporters. At first I thought they were crazy. And now I'm starting to understand 
there is an explanation for everything that I hated. And uh, I'm hoping that this, my story will inspire people who are maybe torn or in the middle or who are on the left to kind of reevaluate and, and maybe take my story and think, okay, I'm, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And maybe what I'm being told, there is an agenda behind. I do feel like there is an agenda that all of us are kind of under and we have to break free from that and do our own research to find out what it is that we, you know, what it is that we believe in, Yeah, you know? So I, I hope that, you know, helps. It definitely does, Dirk. And you covered all the bases I wanted to make sure that. <laughs> and what I'll say too, is that as I'm listening to you, I'm getting what a lazy label it is, even is to call you a Trump supporter. It's convenient. It's easy. Yet what is more accurate is to say that you're a person on a journey for a while you were on the Democrat side and then now you're on the Trump side, <coughs> excuse me. And what stands to reason is that who knows where you're going next. You're on this constant evolutionary continuum, right? So to say that you or anyone is a Trump supporter and therefore you're branded for life, Scarlet letter A, just kill them off as far as we're right. concerned. It just shows the lack of humanity and really seeing you for the person that you are. And might I add, I tried talking to so many of my friends about this stuff through my, that two months of, of, of that I told you I was kind of sick in my stomach. All of my left friends, all of my Democratic friends, I, I have to be truthful and unfortunately say I could not I could not get them to talk with me. I could not get them to discuss things with that with me without getting very angry, calling me a conspiracy theorist, calling me dug in, calling me all these names. And I'm just typing away and saying, you know me, you know, I'm not like this. You know, I don't, didn't like Trump. Why won't you hear me out? And they say, dude, you're being convinced that this is, it's a conspiracy theory and you, you're, you fell for it. And I'm like, no, that's not the case. Look at this evidence. And they didn't want to look at it and they would delete me, block me or run away. And so I found it very, very difficult to talk to people. And that's why I really wanted to do this. So I could, I could hopefully talk to people, hopefully reach out to people. Well, we're so glad you did. And looking at the comments, there leaves no doubt that others are glad you did as well. So thank you for your courage and for sharing your story. We're going to keep things running. Absolutely. Yeah, Sorry. thank you. And please hang around. We're going to keep <laughs> moving to thank you. our next, we'll let's put the label on again, Trump supporter, <laughs> Celosia. Let's go ahead and unmute Celosia. Uh, yes, yeah, so we will have time for questions at the end and put your questions in the chat box. We'll do our best to get to them, but we will have uh, an afterglow period. So just quickly noting the structure for tonight. We will complete at 7 p.m. We have a few other folks to get to and my commitment is to stay on until the last person wants to leave. You can hold me to that. So after seven o'clock, I'll be around and whoever wants around to discuss more. I know some of um, the folks who are sharing tonight will be around after seven o'clock and that's time for more informal discussion. In the meantime, please do put your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to get to them. Hello, Celosia. Hi, hi everybody. Um, so I was born in 1974 in Berkeley, California of all places, go figure. I think um, that definitely breaks um, through at least one, um, what's the word? Uh, <laughs> I don't, uh, not assumption, but you know, like liberals, right? Oh, we think stereotype. of liberals coming from Berkeley. And I definitely define myself as a liberal. And um, I actually find President Trump to be precious. And I like to tell people that because I think most people's experience of him and his tone of voice is like, precious like how in the world can somebody get to putting that adjective with that man right so um i'm also the oldest of 10 children and um even though i grew up in a largely um pro-choice community and perceived myself to be pro-choice um, in my adult years, I realized that I really am very much from a pro-life family because that's what happens when you have, you know, nine siblings. Well, I have two halves so, as well. Um, so just wanted to share that because I know for a lot of people, um, when it comes to right and left, that's like a really core thing is how people 
value life. Yeah, um, well, I you also, used a word just now though, that is not commonly associated with Trump is precious. So let's take right. a closer look at that. And one thing I appreciate from you, Solacia, when we were speaking at length the other day, I immediately recognized you like, wow, your spirituality is very important to you. <laughs> Within the first two minutes of Absolutely. our conversation, it was just evidence to me, uh, which indicates, you know, as we talk further, certainly that you're very sensitive to energy and how people are being and how they're speaking. So for you to use a word like precious in reference to who Trump is being when he's speaking, how he communicates with certain journalists, other candidates, can you say more? How can you experience him as precious? Or how do you experience him as precious? Yeah, it, well, I've watched a lot of his speeches, not nearly as many as my mom, but um, I've watched a lot of his speeches. And I just think of him kind of as a grandpa. Um, anytime he's talking about somebody like having met with this person or sitting at a round table, he's full of compliments. He often says, oh, and, and it's just simple. It's they're great. You know, I'd met this person. He was great. I met that dictator. He was great. He's my favorite dictator, or you know what I mean? which is ironic, but, um, but you know, he, he describes people in a positive light frequently in his speeches and, um, and yeah, he tell like if you listen from one speech to the next to the next, and then you kind of following him on Twitter, you like you realize like Grandpa's just telling the same story he told yesterday, but then you know there's like it's evolved a little. There's a next step. There's you know time is um, you know being added to it. So the story and and the experience that he's having is changing. Right. And he well, really the rebuttal that many people story. would have is that when grandpa is sharing his stories, people aren't getting killed as a result or hurt or compromised or suppressed. And that's certainly been the litany about Trump that he has these agendas that continually uh, suppress others, minorities and so on. Well, so, um, speak to that. you know, there was a, there was a 19 year old young man who was killed up in Chaz or Chop in Seattle when the um, downtown Seattle was taken over. And uh, his father received a phone call from President Trump. And there's video evidence of this man saying like, you know, I couldn't believe it. The president of the United States called me with his condolences. So um, the president, I think, has had respect for state government and state authority not going into Seattle, not going into Portland. So even though a lot of people want to blame him for being that person who, you know, isn't stopping violence, you know, he's re actually respecting the state's authority to manage the situation in those places. Mm -hmm. So why do you think he's getting portrayed this way? because he's anti-establishment. He's not the polit a politician. He, um, in October 2016, Trump versus the establishment, um, that's a great speech. And it, I, I didn't hear it in 2016. I was not a Trump supporter, um, similar to Dirk, where, you know, just in, in March when COVID started, I, I wanted, I, I saw these off the wall um, titles of, you know, articles. And I went, oh my God, I just couldn't believe it. And I had a sister who was like, well, you know, like we really need to give him a chance. And she had been saying this to me for a couple of years and I was still like very skeptical, but, um, but I decided to subscribe to the white house so I could catch the press briefings in the area where I live in Northern California. We've had some pretty big fires in the last few years. So I learned to watch press briefings as a part of like, how to navigate an emergency. And so I wanted to hear from him directly and I subscribed to, I created a Twitter account just so I could subscribe to him and see what is he saying. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the three most positive things that Trump has done for this country, for this world? Um, the Abraham Peace Accord, I think is a really big one. Uh, that was the agreement with the United Arab Emirates and uh, Israel and uh, Bayran, and then Sudan a couple weeks later came into the peace accord. So uh, making peace in the Middle East. And um, 
I think I don't know what price transparency is going to be exactly, but that's starting that's coming out January 1st. And that has to do with lowering the cost of pharmaceuticals and medications for people in healthcare. And then um, I think 180 million people are affected by diabetes. Maybe that's not in the shouldn't be in the top three. Um, <laughs> but but dropping the prices 65% for um, people, I think that was a good negotiation. Uh, creating jobs. Oh, no. Bringing pride to this country. Helping people, helping to people to restore the memory of what it means to live in a country that we can be proud of. I think that is what the president is doing in a great way. And I think in my whole life, I haven't had any reason to be exceptionally proud to be an American. I've been proud to be from a diverse community where uh, multiculturalism is celebrated, but I haven't really had a deep pride until now. And like since I started following him, boy, did my ancestors, like they, their DNA is in me, like for sure, because I have a long history of ancestors who have served this country and fought and put down their lives for um, so that we can have freedom. Yeah, I sense that the, you have, you had maybe had more angst when you were on the left than you have now. Is that fair to say? That, you know what, my mom and I talk about this a lot, just how like, well, if you want to have hope, you know, I had, I lost a dear, dear friend of mine, and she was telling me about how horrible everything is. And my mom said, well, why don't you write back to her and tell her, thank you so much for opening my eyes to how depressing everything is. I'm going to bury my head now. But, you know, I haven't been like that. Instead, I've been so enthusiastic for life and so optimistic. And um, yeah, the president has definitely restored hope for me and I have a great respect for him. And um, I also love that he has children who work with him and who respect him and, you know, are contributing to his hard work. And um, yeah, so I think their speeches have also been heartening to me. All right. Now, what about this issue of uh, polarization? And polarization. how do you see this uh, you know, issue to resolve? Yeah. yeah, please share about that. Thank you for that question. Um, I. I think it's very painful to experience in personal relationships. Like I said, I have a 25 year old friend who I confided in because I was thinking about moving and she ignored the subject and just focused in on, you know, me being very vulnerable with sharing that I support the president. And um, one of the things that I've been curious about is like, where does people's hatred come from? for the president like is it like is it really your own hatred or is it manufactured i i suspect that a lot of people's hatred for the president was it like it came from outside themselves from the information that they've collected and the sources of information that has that they that they've been attracted to for whatever the reason um so i'd like to think that perhaps um Perhaps we can, you know, overcome that. I don't think that um, a communist or socialist path is going to be our, um, well, like I think of, you know, like there's a lot of people on the right who don't want communism or socialism. And so, and there's a lot of people on the right who want and see that that's like, that's not so bad, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for us there. There can be more equality, but I think, like we can have a lot of the goals of the left come together, but we need the structure of the right. And um, especially, you know, not everybody on the right is gonna be great. Uh, I think each side, any party is susceptible to being hijacked. But right now we have a particular leader who's, um, who's got a lot of different skills and he thinks outside of the box. He doesn't think like a politician. That's one of the reasons why he was successful creating the Abraham Peace Accord. And um, so again, like I think we can have a lot of the ideals come to, pa come to fruition that those of us on the left hold, but we just need a different, it, it, we need a different structure. We need somebody who uh, is creative and wants the best for our nation and not for big, you know, big interests, so, or okay. the elite, you know, the Rothschilds, let's say that. <laughs> yeah. 
Great. So not to tease too much, but I'm going to put out a couple of questions that are sent to me privately just for consideration. And then we're gonna move on to Tiamo and Diane just in the interest of time. So thank you so much for sharing, Felicia. Uh, you did prompt some questions that are sent to me privately. This is regarding pride and polarization. What do you say to the fact that there are so many, especially on the left, that have the lowest pride in America as a result of him? So this is just something to consider. Right. Again, I'm just going to leave it at that. And then another question is about the structure of the right, which has been criticized for not following basic science. And how is that serving us and the mismanagement of the pandemic? So I know these are longer discussion points, and we can pick this up afterwards. But I do want to give voice to uh, as many different sides of this as possible. So I do want to point that out. And thank you, Celestia, for sharing your story and please think around. All right, let's go to Tiamo and Diane. Please unmute yourselves, here they are. Hey guys. Hi everyone. Hey everybody. All right, just to share. I'm Diane. Yes, <laughs> let's clear that up from the get-go. <laughs> Diane on the right, Tiamo on the left. Two of my best friends, uh, when I was married, Back in 2016, the four of us would get together and bash the hell out of Trump. I remember those dinners vividly. And a lot's happened since then. And I was very excited for you guys to share your journey. So before we get into that, if you could just share uh, your ages, where are you from? So where are you born, where do you live now? And what do you do for a living? Well, uh, my name is Diane. Uh, we now in Arizona, in Scottsdale. We are from San Diego area, where the two of us met and left an amazing community there. Um, I am 54, and yes, I'm a cougar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 44, so you guys can do the math there. <laughs> and uh, I am a stay-at-home mom. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm 44 and I'm a speaker and a trainer and a lover of life. All right, beautiful. And anyway, we can see beautiful Jatem, or is she not available? Um, not no, yeah, if we get her involved, it, things could get derailed a little bit. So. We're very lucky right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just bring it to the question at hand. How did you become Trump supporters? Well, you want me to start? Yeah. Okay, so I, as you know, despised Trump, really thought he was going to take us into World War III, um, was really scared for our country. And, um, but I also, for years, I have felt like this can't be all that, um, humanity is. It just seems like it's going worse, worse, and worse. And so I always was open to like, how could there be a better solution or, or something better out there for us? You know, when we were deciding to have a child, uh, I had this feeling that, do I even want to bring a child into this world in, in the way that it's going? I mean, is that even fair? So um, we, like everybody else so far and in march when the coronavirus hit and there was the shutdown i kept something was bothering me something wasn't quite right so i just started looking into everything and started to research and i came across a lot of stuff that opened my eyes i was very um i don't know if you've uh, heard of the word cognitive dissidence where when you think you're so right on something that anything else doesn't matter like you couldn't talk yourself in anything and I was really like that about many things but then as I started to research and um, I just started stumbling across information that I'd never seen before or never heard it the way I was hearing it because I was open my heart was open and little by little my heart started softening towards Trump and I remember at the dinner table I told told Tiamo and his dad that I thought that my heart was softening towards Trump my girlfriend gave me some information and from there on out i just i just started seeing things in a different light so that was like nine months ago 
Yeah, we definitely want to hear more about that journey. Uh, Tiam, is there anything you want to share? Yeah, I'll just share that for, for me, I really started around just wanting to know more about what this deep state was that I was hearing about, like the deep state, Illuminati, Cabal, whatever name you have for it. Like I was just hearing terms about elite um, and people in power and suppression of freedoms. And so I'm really a true seeker. It started with Diane and she was having conversations with me and I was very much like, what is happening to my wife? <laughs> where, where is she going with this? I'm losing my wife. Um, but, you know, I was really paying attention and valuing what she had to share. And as she was doing more research, we started doing it together. And a lot of these things to me started to feel undeniable. And, uh, and so I just, we, we really valued that and we really started searching for more and we started really feeling into what feels true for us, not what's true for other people's filters or what lands for other people, um, but what is landing for us. And so that's how we got here. Yeah, I, I prayed and prayed. I was just saying, if I'm on the wrong course, please show me God, because I don't want to be there. You know, and I, I just, every day I'd pray and, but every day I would get more and more um, uh, proof that I was on the right path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am curious to hear about some blowback that you've gotten for being Trump supporters and just what is that like for you on a daily basis? Well, well, first of all, there's the political side of this, but there's also a very deep spiritual side. And I don't know if we have time to go into that, but, but with, I've had some really, really close friends that I've talked to about this and, and, because of the community that I'm, I'm in and the people, they love me for who I am, but there've been a few that actually have like um, done, they've gone to extreme length to try to dissuade me of my opinions. And, um, and so, yeah, so I just stopped talking about it. I, I did just to the people that were the closest to me. And, and I found that many of them were also supportive uh, Trump supporters, and a lot of them in the, my spiritual community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so share more about the journey, and a question that came up here is, how do you determine what is true versus not true? I think this is a very valuable question to look at because we have this culture of fake news and propaganda and spin. There's certainly those who would call a deep state just an empty conspiracy. So how do you go about discerning what is true or not? What's your barometer for that? Well, um, I, I go beyond the mainstream media and um, I listen to a lot of Trump speeches. I mean, President Trump, he skewed a lot in his speeches. Um, the, really in this day and age where there's so much censoring going on right now, I mean, it's insane out there um, that you have to kind of rely on um, those that have taken on um, researching and, and finding truth and finding uh, uh, through the not so mainstream media where you can find things that aren't centered. Google is a highly censored um, search platform. Um, so I go to DuckDuckGo, which is uh, private and it's, um, it's not as sensitive. Well, it isn't censored at all as far as I know. And that's where I find a lot of my information too. I want to read you guys a message I got from someone that I know from the spiritual entrepreneur community who is in opposition to Trump, and I'd love to get your guys' response to it. The current president's methods and behavior squarely contradict the values I hold most dear. I know you know all this, and I suspect feel similarly, <laughs> and it's still worth enumerating for its enormity. I value kindness. He mocks those with weaknesses and disabilities and name calls like a schoolyard bully. I value peace. He stokes or looks the other way at violence and hatred. I value honesty. He lies at a breathtaking pace. I value curiosity and inquiry. He rejects scientific consensus and shuts down any questioning. I value accountability. He demonizes the press and anyone who disagrees with his actions. I value mindfulness. He reacts impulsively to any slight. I value inclusion. He uses racist terms and belittles efforts for racial justice. 
I value self-reflection and taking responsibility. He projects his flaws onto others. I value fair and free governments. He cozies up to dictators and insults our long time allies. These are not policies, they're fundamental behaviors and they're genuinely worthy of shame in the most traditional sense. Thoughts? Many of them, <laughs> but Lots. there are just a few. Um, first, I really honor his passion for what he believes is true and uh, expresses it in a really beautiful way. Second, I would ask him if, you have, if he's ever had a conversation with Donald Trump. Third, I would ask, is this based on the filter of mainstream media? My sense is that it probably is because it depends on how, like, which lens you are looking at through. If you're looking at through the lens of the mainstream media, I can absolutely see why he would feel that way. If he's looking at it through the lens of something else that the minority of people like us are actually willing to go off the path, very far off the path to find out more truth that's not so in front of us, but behind the curtain, I just wonder if those beliefs and those judgments, I would say, are actually based on just, is that the filter of the mainstream media or is that coming from somewhere else? So for me, my big question is, what is the source of that? All right, Diane, anything for you? Well, I just, I think that um, as it's been said before, there's a lot of um, the, media has skewed so much of the truth. And um, like Dirk even said, he, he, he started listening to the full speeches. He started seeing that, I mean, you can take anything and you can twist it in any way, uh, given the opportunity. And, um, and just to look past that and uh, do your own research is what I say, it's all out there. You just have to do your own research to find it. And if it feels right, the thing is, is you have to go inside. And you have to, to, to decide, if, does this resonate with me? Um, I also, I've never used the word precious for Trump, but I adore him. I adore him. I think he loves America more than any one of us. And he stands for the people. So um, and I'm, I'm kind of getting off track here, but yeah. I just, well, let's <laughs> read a comment from Janet, who this is, I think, in response to the encouragement to do our own research. I'm watching a live video of Trump via White House on YouTube and see with my own eyes him mocking a reporter. And this has been well documented. So, yes, so many of the reporters, basically they take what he says and they skew it when they go back to the uh, media outlets where they come from and they completely skew it. He has been under fire 24 seven since he's been president, even before then. And with that, um, he knows them, he calls them out. He's not afraid of calling them out. He, he just puts them in their place. And he even says, you know, I know you're gonna go and you're gonna completely skew my words. You know, he says, I've seen, heard him say that many, many times. Um, so whatever, whatever he says to the press conference, it will be changed and manipulated to, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I would, I don't know if uh, we are claiming that Trump is the most articulate or polite, or any of these things as far as what he's, how he communicates in his style. I don't think many people actually would feel that he is soft in his style. <laughs> um, or that there's times where he missteps or says the wrong thing or is judgmental vocally, you know what? I have a feeling that a lot of us are like that. And I think he does say a lot of things that we think are too afraid to say. And I also would say that it's really important, like if you're looking for truth, go where the unseen is. Because where the unseen is and where things are being censored, you'll find a lot of truth there. Because you ask what's behind the censorship? What is it that they do not want us to know? And when you find out what that is and you see the patterns and the loopholes, you start to find out more. So this goes beyond someone's personal character. I'm not so much worried about if I sat down and had lunch with Trump, what would go down? I'm more worried about the state of the world. I'm more worried about children being saved. I'm more worried about these global efforts that no one before Trump was actually doing until now, but no one's covering it. Why is no one covering it? To keep people in power. 
to mm -hmm. keep the mind controlling. Yeah, so how about you do go ahead and share the three most positive things, or more if you would like to, that Trump has done. Well, first of all, he's had like over 125, 100, 125 accomplishes, accomplishments um, during his um, role as a president. But um, I'm just reading from my list because I have so many of them. Um, one of the things that is a huge thorn in many side, side, any many people's sides is the wall that he's built um, between um, our borders here, um, Mexico and um, the U.S. And he's actually done that for the sole reason to, to help combat crime, human trafficking, and drugs. And I don't know about you, but that is huge to me. I mean, yes, we are putting a border between two countries, but he has, he has really, um, with that, with the human trafficking especially, because a lot of it comes through Mexico, um, he has made a commitment to end tra uh, child trafficking, human trafficking, and crimes against humanity. And he's actually, um, just since his term, he's had thousands of ar arrests for um, those that have pr um, done crimes against humanity. And he's rescued hundreds of, of children too. Hundreds, if not thousands of children. I, I don't know the number, but um, he's, he's really made a commitment to that. And being a mom, it has never hit me so deep. I have been on my knees. I have, I have bawled my eyes out. I've had been physically sick hearing about the things that have gone on that I didn't know that was happening with crimes against humanity. And um, so that's one of them. Also, um, and, and the victims are as young, like one years old too. I mean, that's just, it's disgusting. But um, also he has uh, the Save the Seas Act, which is cleaning the seas of tons and tons of plastic. And I know a lot of our community is very huge on environmental issues. He's also um, signed the biggest wilderness protection bill that has ever been in place. And I can't remember exactly how many thousands of acres he has uh, set aside to preserve. Um, and I mean, he's also kept almost every single campaign promise that he had put out there. He's kept in uh, all of them um, that he was able to um, take care of. I don't, I don't even know which all of them. I was not political, by the way. Uh, before, <laughs> before all of this started happening, I, I voted independent. I threw my vote because I didn't believe in Hillary or Trump. I, I voted for Jill Stein. And um, yeah, so I, I've never been more political in my life. I've never been more proud to be an American. I've never, I've never felt such community and um, love sitting on this side. As crazy as that sounds. Because believe me, nine months ago, I would have thought it was all crazy. A lot more angst. Also, um, he's, Sorry. yeah, yeah, there's so much hate and, and, and just, uh, it's, yeah. It's just a very low vibration Watch that I felt. Yeah, that I, now, get, I get to. Uh, sorry, Diane, I want to make sure we get to this and there's so much we can cover. Julia Phoenix, I know. I'm curious how uh, you feel about the very derogatory comments that have been made by Trump about women and where he can, quote, grab them. As a woman and a trauma survivor, I cried deeply when I heard that clip. What's your response? I'm yeah. unaware of that clip. That's more for so you. It's hard for me. Yeah, Diane, that question's for oh, you. Oh, for me? Yeah. Oh, um, I don't think that, well, so we all come from a past, okay? Um, yeah, I don't condone that behavior at all. In fact, I find it very repulsive. Um, I, I, I don't, who is it? Who, Julia? Um, I actually have never been a subject to anything like that. So my heart goes out. It, he, we all have pasts. We may not even be very proud of. I, I think that, yes, I've seen some things that he's done prior and I know that he's there's pictures of him with Jeffrey Epstein and I know all of that but I had to decide what is he doing now what is he doing today to ensure that we as Americans and then also my daughter have 
a stable um, future. And I think it's with him. I, I know it's with him. Of course. And like I said before, go ahead. I want to keep it moving. Uh, this is terrific, though. What is your opinion on Trump administration's handling of the pandemic? Well, he has not. Do you want to talk anymore? Right. <laughs> um, so he he actually has given it to every. I think he's done a really good job in in what he's been able to do, but they're not letting him do much. He has been given false information after false information, um, and he's been showing. I don't. I don't believe there is a pandemic. So I know that there is the coronavirus out there. But I think it's all media hype. I think the numbers are skewed. Um, he's doing the best he can, but he's letting each just every, each governor rule their own um, and decide what's best. I I think he's doing a great job with what he has, honestly. And I know a lot of people blame him, but you know Obama had H1N1, and there were ten times more people who who are affected by that. He was not blamed for it. And um, uh, he, I believe China was blamed for it, just like, um, I believe what it is, but Obama never got blamed for it. It's just the way they're skewing it. They're putting all the blame on him so that he has to take the heat. Obama with the H1N1, with I think it was 61 million people that got it, he was never put to blame at all. It's just what they want you guys to believe. Um, and I'll quickly share as well. And I gotta um, be right back. Okay. Uh, I, and we believe, and it's okay if others don't believe this, I strongly believe that there is a vaccine agenda. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also believe that is really the manufacturing of COVID and the fear narrative around COVID. Um, we living here in Phoenix have actually met multiple people who work at hospitals who talk about how hospitals are completely ghost towns and empty, when what we're hearing on the news is that they're overflowing and they need more doctors and nurses. So am I gonna believe the people who actually work in the hospitals or am I gonna believe the news? So as far as how we handled it, the other thing I ask people is I say, how, what would you have done differently? Like the way he's handled it the best that he can is actually keep our country open. And when I ask people, what would you have done differently? I never get, any kind of response that to me feels like a solution. It's just really, to me, it feels really easy and super convenient to say Trump mishandled COVID, especially around election time. So I could go into a lot more around that, but that's just the short of my feeling. All right, so we have one minute till top of the hour. Uh, I'm gonna give you guys a final statement, anything you'd like to share, and then we're gonna, put you guys, anyone who wants to hang out. I mentioned the afterglow. We're gonna do 10 minutes of breakout rooms, right? Sense that there's a lot of energy and discussion that can be had around this. So if you wanna stick around and be put into a breakout room, groups of three or four, and debrief on some of this, share some insights, some questions, I'll let you go ahead and do that. But what final things would you two like to say? Well, um... Thank you, John, for bringing us, bringing us all together like this. It's, it's, I hope that um, it has given some nuggets, some, something to let other people chew on. Uh, I know that um, this really deserves more than a 10, 15 minute mm -hmm. slot <laughs> per person. Um, so maybe you can extra, maybe you can think about possibly doing something a little bit longer. Uh, or part two. Uh, part yeah, two. part two. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I don't, I love everybody, you know me, and regardless, uh, most of my friends, I voted Democrat, but I just, just search within, search within, because it's there, the answer's always there. Don't be, don't be external. Uh, I'll say that for the last 20 years, I voted Democrat. I was very hooked into and identified with that. And this year, more than ever, I value freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom to live the life that I wanna live, uh, freedom to protect our safety, 
And I've seen many layers where I believe those freedoms are being taken away day by day. And I've seen where masses of people, including me recently, were okay with it because it was justified. So I really, I just, uh, I think once you take the red pill, you can't ever go back. And all I would say to people is you can take the red pill and if you don't like what you see, then go back in the matrix. But if you have experience like we've had, there's no way I'm going back in. It's impossible. So I can understand where people would question how we would feel this way, question sources, question where we're getting our information, all those things. We don't have the time to go into that. If we did, we could go, we could go way past midnight. But really it's just coming from the heart of uh, where our future as a family, what we want for our daughter who's three and a half years old, and what we want for humanity, which is being able to have these kind of freedoms because I question if we go on the path that we're on that we could actually have Zoom calls like this in the future. Mm -hmm. So I'm thankful that we can now, and I'm thankful, thankful to you, John, for, for leading this and everyone who's been on this call. Yeah, well, everyone's thankful for you. Uh, you can check the chat box for that. So I love you guys and honor you guys. Thank you so much for your courage. We'll take you off the hot seat and just send you lots of love. And I just want to remind everyone that we're all just sharing our personal experiences. I used the Alcoholics Anonymous or seminar analogy earlier that this is subjective reality that we're each sharing, that there is no agreed upon objective reality uh, as far as I'm concerned. So these are invitations. You can take it on as you wish, and there's no need to get pissed off about it as far as I'm concerned. 